There is a history of games. Game history is interwoven with human history, starting in the Egyptian Empire 5,000 years ago. Ancient games foretold the future for citizens and kings. As games were played, fate was decided in magical ceremonies. These were called the Shadow Games. This was an excerpt from the first page of the manga for the incredibly popular series known as Yu-Gi-Oh! Just off this, you can tell there must have been a heavy emphasis on magic, and more importantly, games. Now, why were games so important to its creator? How did Yu-Gi-Oh! propel itself to become one of the most popular franchises in the world? And what was the legacy left behind by the series and its creator? This is the story of how Yu-Gi-Oh! and its creator, Kazuki Takahashi, became the king of games in the Anamanga slash card world. Yu-Gi-Oh! all started with one man, the late great Kazuki Takahashi, who this video is made in honor of his recent passing. To get a better idea of what this series is and why it was so beloved, let's take a trip back to the past before the series first started so we can get a chronological look at the rise of Yu-Gi-Oh! Kazuo Takahashi, better known as Kazuki Takahashi, was born on October 4th, 1961, in Tokyo, Japan. His birth name is Kazuo, but he operated under the pen name of Kazuki, and so out of respect, I'll refer to him by his pen name throughout the video. There were two passions that Kazuki Takahashi had, which led to his future success. Ever since he was a boy, Kazuki has always been a huge fan of games. Throughout his life, he enjoyed playing games like Shogi, Mahjong, card games, tabletop RPGs, and so on. Another passion of his was art, which was something he was drawn to at a young age. In a foreword, Takahashi would bring up a cool story of his childhood. An old man would come to his neighborhood to perform Kamishibai, a sort of storytelling puppet show done through illustrated boards. Kazuki was eager to watch the show, but what captivated him the most were the pictures. He wondered to himself if the old man drew the pictures, and he would go as far as to chase the man while he was on his bicycle to find out. Takahashi would mention how he never got to ask the old man as he was too fast on his bike. Takahashi never got the answer he was looking for, and perhaps it was for the better, as Kazuki would say how maybe this old man was the reason he became so enamored with art, leading him to become a manga artist. Little did he know, both interests would intersect and shake up the entertainment world as we would come to know. When Takahashi was in 7th grade, a teacher would embarrass him in front of the whole class by saying, all you do is eat, sleep, and poop. You're a poop making machine. While the whole class would laugh, Takahashi would clench his fist and remark to himself that a poop making machine can't write manga. This was an important moment for him as well when deciding to become a manga artist, and the rest is history. The above story shows us how the smallest of seeds could be planted in your childhood and through time it could blossom into something magnificent. This is what happened to Takahashi, and I am sure each and every one of us had small moments like this that came to define who we are today. Despite his love for arts and games, it was only in high school that Kazuki Takahashi started drawing manga. At the age of 19, Takahashi would enter a contest for Shonen Jump, the best-selling manga magazine, and his manga story would win the competition. Despite that, it wasn't smooth sailing for Takahashi just yet. He would go on to create manga, mainly one-shots, for the next decade. Takahashi would publish Tokyo no Suma in 1990, followed by Tenen Shokudanji Bure, which ran for two volumes from 1991 to 1992. Up to this point, Takahashi didn't find any real success with his creations, and this will continue until 1996. In this fateful year, a manga would release, and this would go on to become the building blocks for a franchise that will captivate the world. A franchise that would go on to become the most iconic card game of its time, revolutionizing the industry while enchanting fans worldwide. Takahashi would create Yu-Gi-Oh! a manga that was predominantly based on games. Being a massive fan of games, Takahashi wanted to incorporate some of this passion into a manga when fighting battle manga were incredibly popular, he would take the risky step by creating a battle manga where there was no physical combat. For reference, in 1995, 
Dragon Ball Z had just finished its manga run, and Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Part 5 Golden Wind was ongoing. At the time, both of these series were incredibly popular combat-oriented manga, and they were among Takahashi's favorite manga of all time. If you look at the list of the other top shonen manga at the time, they all had their similarities, with most being combat slash sports related. We had Slam Dunk, which was a very popular sports manga at the time, finishing its run in 1996. Detective Conan was a popular manga series as well that started in 1994, with it being a mystery manga. Some other top combat manga at the time were Hajime no Ippo, a boxing manga, Baki the Grappler, a combat manga, and Roroni Kenshin, a manga on samurai. Of course, many manga in the shonen category would soon rise up, like One Piece, Naruto, Bleach, Hunter x Hunter, with these manga coming after Yu-Gi-Oh's release. Some other popular manga before 1996 when Yu-Gi-Oh was released were Kochikame, Tokyo Beat Cops, Fist of the North Star, and Kinikuman, or Ultimate Muscle, as us Western fans know it as. I could go on and on, but the point of this was to paint a picture on some of the popular manga at the time, as well as before and after. Seeing all the top shonen titles, you can see that Yu-Gi-Oh was pretty different from the top manga at the time. As history would show, Yu-Gi-Oh would go on to become popular and well known worldwide, more so than many of the aforementioned series. There were no hand to hand fights to the death or hyped sporting events in this series, rather, Yu-Gi-Oh was a manga focused predominantly on games, but at the start, that alone would not captivate crowds, let alone garner the attention of editors. In order to differentiate his work from a basic manga that plays games, as well as to win over the minds of the magazine editors, Takahashi added a horror element to his games. These games weren't your ordinary ones. They were shadow games, magical, mystical games, enshrouded in darkness, coupled in with fatal consequences. Despite common thought, the original manga was quite dark, which was a far cry from what the series will later evolve into. More on that later. But let's go through the story of the manga so we can get a better idea of things. In the first chapter, we are introduced to Yugi Moto, a small, weak, introverted boy who would rather play his own games than do what everyone else is doing. Yugi introduces his prized possession, his greatest treasure, and is then picked on by two boys, Junuichi Katsuya, Joey Wheeler in the dubbed version, and Honda Hiroto who was Tristan Taylor in the dub release. Junuichi would tell Yugi that if he wants the box back, he would have to hit him like a man. Yugi would then reply by saying that he hates fighting. He never ends up throwing a punch. And I think that was quite fitting, especially when you relate it to the rest of the top manga at the time, which mainly had physical combat. In a way, Junuichi was the status quo of the time in battle manga, and Yugi was Yu-Gi-Oh! A series that stood out in its own way, rising to the top while refusing to forcibly follow the path set by others. The name Yugi itself means game in Japanese, and once you add O, it makes king of games. You can say that once he unlocked the prized puzzle of his, that is what he became, as he inherited the shadow games, a dark set of games with high stakes, as well as an alter persona. This is where the manga took a dark turn, and it was a bit creepy at times. I mean, just look at this guy. You would have to see things like this for many of the starting chapters. In the first Shadow game, we see Yugi would play Russian Roulette with a knife alongside a money-seeking bully. And after the bully disobeyed the rules, he was hit with the Law of Avarice, which basically made him go mad thinking he was rich. The bully attempted to swindle Yugi earlier on with quite a bit of money, and the consequences of this game gave him the illusion that his surroundings were money when they were clearly not. The shadow games continued on with a crooked director who manipulated others and faked his show for a better press. Yugi would play a game with him, a roll of dice, and the director would end up losing, getting him stuck in a mosaic illusion. This made everything the director saw to be exactly that, as Yugi would say, for bending the truth in front of the camera, from now on, all he would see is now censored. These games were a way of karma, where kid Yugi would often get wronged or bullied, and once he activated his millennium puzzle, he would bring upon much deserved punishments and suffering through the shadow games. 
we would witness ways that punish the evildoers in ironic ways so that they would either learn their lesson or never get the chance to wrong anyone else again. We saw that with his first bully who tried to extort Yugi for large amounts of money and as a result he would go seemingly crazy, perceiving random objects like leaves as money. The second bully would fake his show at the expense of others and then after the shadow games, his sight would be reduced to an illusion, just like all of his shows were, whether it be through a swift and brutal lesson, to a life-changing work of magic, or even death, Yugi and his dark persona would bring upon justice to wrongdoers and criminals everywhere they went. This would go on for a few episodes until a certain game was introduced that would gain massive popularity and eventually take over the manga. Through the variety of shadow games we witnessed, in chapter 9, Takahashi would introduce a game called Magic and Wizards. This game was inspired by Magic the Gathering, with its name being a direct reference to it, taking magic from the name and wizards from Wizards of the Coast, the company that made Magic the Gathering. In this chapter, we would be introduced to a card game through Yugi's grandpa, and we would even see the introduction of a fan favorite character in Seto Kaiba, as well as some prototype versions of some of our favorite cards. Yugi and his friends would check out some of these cards in his grandpa's shop and we would be introduced to the snobby card hoarder in Kaiba who would put down everyone until he saw a rare blue eyes white dragon. Yugi's grandpa would tell Kaiba, a spoiled schoolboy, something pretty profound when talking about his cards. If you really treasure something, it grows a heart of its own, just like this card. You will never trade anything for that heart, so take care of each and every card in this trunk Kaiba, then you'll find the strength of the games. Yugi's grandpa was alluding to something that will later be termed as the heart of the cards, which I'll discuss more later. But this manga was filled with some deep quotes like this. This chapter would end up with Yugi dueling Kaiba. After the blue eyes white dragon was stolen by Kaiba, Kaiba would summon the blue eyes white dragon, but it would refuse to fight and disappear, since it was not his, in a way, explaining how Kaiba's heart and soul were not in that card. Yugi would use Monster Reborn to summon the blue eyes and defeat Kaiba. His punishment of the shadow game would send him in a card of the dual monsters game, all in an effort to help Kaiba understand the heart of the cards. Magic and Wizards was the name the card game was first given, but it was later named Dual Monsters. This game in the manga would later be the prototype for Yu-Gi-Oh as we know it today. The Yu-Gi-Oh manga was originally designed to host separate shadow games each time, but Dual Monsters had become so popular that Yu-Gi-Oh itself was made to revolve around it. The regular style of Yu-Gi-Oh with shadow games would continue until the Duelist Kingdom arc in Volume 8 Chapter 61, where the series will make a full switch into a Dual Monsters centered plot. Through Dual Monsters, some characters would duel to be the best, some would do so to uncover dark mysterious secrets, and some will duel for the fate of the world and the rest is history. Over the next few years, Yu-Gi-Oh would expand exponentially and boom in popularity. The manga would run for 8 years, from 1996 to 2004. The series would have a total of 38 volumes, with 343 chapters, with the majority of them revolving around the card game. Although the manga was steadily gaining popularity, this was just the start of the worldwide phenomenon. With the success of the manga, other media adaptations would soon arise. This is where Yu-Gi-Oh got big. Manga spin-offs, anime adaptations, film adaptations, video games, toys, and even a real-life version of the card game would come to fruition. Let's go through them in order. After the original manga run, Yu-Gi-Oh was so popular that it would start a series of spin-offs. Although Kazuki Takahashi wasn't in charge of these series, he was working in the background as a supervisor for most of the spin-offs. Since then, we would see numerous adaptations in Yu-Gi-Oh R, GX, 5Ds, Zeal, Arc 5, Vrains, and Sevens. All these spin-offs would add their own flair to the series, with a new set of characters, strategies, game mechanics, cards, and storylines. But all of them had one thing in common, the same base card game. One of the most important pieces of media for Yu-Gi-Oh's popularity, even more so than the manga would be the anime adaptations. The first anime adaptation Yu-Gi-Oh would get would be from Toei Animation, the animation studio behind behemoths like the Dragon Ball series and One Piece. This would be a 27 episode anime based on volumes 1 to 7, so the volumes before the proverbial takeover of Duel Monsters. In 2000, Yu-Gi-Oh would reach the western world, 
with an animation for Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters, made by Nihon Ad Systems. This anime would reach more than 60 countries and be dubbed in more than 60 languages. It is safe to say that this was Yu-Gi-Oh!'s introduction to the world, its grand splash in the international stadium. The anime would continue until 2004 and run for 224 episodes. As alluded to earlier, the anime adaptations would continue with the various spin-offs. Many fans' first introduction to the series, myself included, would be from the anime. So this was an important step in Yu-Gi-Oh! stardom. On top of that, Yu-Gi-Oh! would also get some film releases. All these adaptations allowed for Yu-Gi-Oh! to be shared to a whole new audience. This chart here shows a thorough rundown of all the anime and movies released, with a total of 11 anime series, 1100 plus episodes, and 4 movies. All of this airing from 1998 to present time. Throughout this time, a massive collection of toys and merchandise would be released, as well as some novels and numerous video games, which were produced by Konami. In 2006, Konami announced that the Yu-Gi-Oh! games as a whole had sold 17.5 million copies worldwide. Now back to present time, you could expect even higher numbers with the massive library of video games the series has. Saving the best for last, perhaps the coolest and most important part of Yu-Gi-Oh!'s success, would be the official trading cards themselves. At the time, there were very few animanga that had the demand for tangible products. With your regular anime, you had fighting, sports, suspense, or whatever genre, and sure you can get action figures or cards of the various series, but it didn't directly relate to what was happening in the show. What made Yu-Gi-Oh! so special was that you can play the exact card game that you saw in the animanga. All the cards you saw that your favorite characters had, you can get the same ones and add them to your personal deck. In 1998, the exact same cards that we saw in the series were now available to fans and in 2002, an English version will be brought to life. Since then, cards have been officially released in over 40 countries around the world. At the start, I mentioned how Yu-Gi-Oh! was different from other shounen, and as history has shown, that was the reason why it became so successful. If this was another combat slash sports based animanga, it wouldn't have gotten anywhere near the success it had, because there would be no way to replicate a popular standalone game like Yu-Gi-Oh! had done. Compared to other animanga, they simply did not have the capability for this. Growing up as a kid during this time, I noticed there were a few series that capitalized well on the real life experience, with Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Beyblades being at the forefront. What made these series so special was that you could obtain your favorite Pokemon through games and cards, Beyblades through the actual spinning top toys, and Yu-Gi-Oh! cards as mentioned earlier. That real life aspect was vital in the explosion of these brands, and Yu-Gi-Oh! has been thriving off this since the inception of the tangible cards. To have your fanbase play the same game, with it being as similar as possible was a very magical thing to do, and it no doubt had a part to play in the series' rise to prominence. It is estimated that as of 2001, about 35 billion cards had been sold worldwide, an incredible feat, making it the most popular training card game in the world. The demand for Yu-Gi-Oh! on so many different areas was a testament to Yu-Gi-Oh!'s popularity, and this would continue till present time. Currently, Yu-Gi-Oh! sports multiple manga series and anime adaptations, a few films, a plethora of video games, some novels, loads of merchandise, and a massive library of real-life cards. Yu-Gi-Oh! had successfully captivated a generation, and the monumental rise of Yu-Gi-Oh! would continue until it would be the most popular card game franchise in the world, as well as one of the highest grossing media franchises of its time. Compared to other media franchises, Yu-Gi-Oh! makes it to the list of the top 25 grossing media franchises in the world. Although the numbers aren't exactly accurate, it does give us a good idea of where the series ranks, with only a few manga being above it, namely Pokemon, Dragon Ball, and in some data, One Piece and Fist of the North Star, although some data shows that Yu-Gi-Oh! earns more than the two franchises. That is the condensed history of Yu-Gi-Oh! And we all have this man to thank for it, the late great Kazuki Takahashi, who this video was made in honor of. Unfortunately, Kazuki Takahashi was found dead in an incident where he drowned. Not much was known about his death at the time and the world was in shock. Many had felt that they had lost a part of their childhood, a part that brought them joy. 
and this was a reason why I decided to make this video. While at the time, the events of his death were unclear, it was only a few months later that more information on his death came out. Takahashi was initially thought to have died in a snorkeling incident, but that was not the case. A US Army officer would account that Takahashi died trying to save others from drowning. Based on his statement, a Japanese woman was calling for help from the waters. She was trapped in a rip current 100 yards from shore. Around the same time, Takahashi entered the water to save the woman and her daughter, and through this heroic effort, he was taken by the waves. The words of the officer were very fitting of Takahashi. He's a hero, said Bourgeau, the officer. He died trying to save someone else. And so, that is how Kazuki Takahashi left this world. Not as an old man, not as a manga artist, not as the creator of the most successful card game in this world, but as a hero, as someone who risked his own life and paid the ultimate price, just to help another in need. The way you live tells a lot about who you are as a person, and in some cases, you can say the same about how you die. Takahashi lived to inspire us all with his creations, and died a hero, trying to save others. I was saddened to hear about Takahashi's death when I first found out, and after finding out his cause of death, I was still sad. However, this made me even more emotional in a different way. I was proud, in a sense, that a man who touched so many lives was able to die as a hero. How his final acts of selflessness will dub him as a king of courage, a noble man of virtue. Some people live to an old age and suffer greatly every day, and some great individuals slowly rot and turn into villains, losing what made them so great. For Takahashi, neither was the case. It brings me reprieve in his death, knowing that Takahashi was truly a man so great that he'd risk his life for others. Although I'm sure many are still saddened by his loss, I believe his reasoning for it is something we all should be proud of and cherish. The man who wrote about such heroic characters was one among them all along, and he showed us that in his final hour. Not every king gets to choose his way out, but for Takahashi, he chose an honorable way, perhaps the most virtuous one, in dying for the sake of helping another in need. Rest in peace, King of Games, Kazuki Takahashi. I don't know if I wanted to include this section, as it sort of includes graphic details on his death that may be offensive. If you don't like such things, please skip ahead to the next section. When Takahashi's body was found, his cause of passing away was stated to be from drowning. It was also revealed that parts of his body were nibbled on by sharks after his passing. After viewing a few videos on Takahashi, I came across one of him giving a house tour. Through this, he talked about his hobbies, his interests, and even revealed his fascination with sharks. He mentioned how he was an avid enjoyer of the animal, being a big fan of media related to them, and even based the Blue Eyes White Dragon design on a shark. And so hearing him talk about that reminded me of what I read from the various articles. The way I viewed it, it was as if the Blue Eyes White Dragon of our world were paying tribute to him after he crossed to the other side. His favorite animals were the first to discover and pay respect to the fallen hero. Of course, all of this does not have any literal meaning. It was more of a symbolic and sentimental way of looking at things. But that was the connection I made when I saw the video. In honor of Kazuki Takahashi, I did not just want to talk about the history of the series, but rather, I wanted to celebrate him and his work. With the history of Yu-Gi-Oh! now covered, let's talk further about different topics like the appeal of the series, some major prevalent themes, the impact it had on us as well as Takahashi's legacy. Let's celebrate Takahashi and his magnum opus Yu-Gi-Oh! Oh, he came from the sands of time. He's the king of games, legends come alive. Evil doers will hide in shame when they taste justice in a shadow game. Shadow. Oh, but even a king has a heart, and the door to that heart, it opens, it parts. There is always a friend in your heart. Yugi, Yugi, Yu-Gi-Oh. The series Yu-Gi-Oh presented itself in a very mystical way. 
the series was not just a regular card game, tying the series to an ancient Egyptian civilization with mythical artifacts enshrouded in mystery gave Yu-Gi-Oh a magical feel to it. The shadow games themselves were a cool twist at the start, and the way Yugi used them to exact justice in ironic ways was appealing, especially for younger audiences. As the series transitioned to dual monsters, we were introduced to an addictive game of strategy, magic, and luck or faith. Instead of a basic card game, Yu-Gi-Oh made things more epic than that. It allowed you to bring monsters to life in these magical duels, and sometimes even literal gods to aid you. All the series of Yu-Gi-Oh have this occult aspect to them. This enshrouded the card games in a mystical aura which captivated fans, giving it a larger than life feel. A regular card game wouldn't be as interesting if you didn't have these magical aspects tied to it. Most of the time, these duels had more meaning than just a game. These duels showcased the art of playing your cards right, defeating all those who came before you, whether friend or foe. These duels were not always just for fun, but oftentimes it was a battle to save the world. The duels in Yu-Gi-Oh were a battle of ideologies, a stage to showcase character, whether valor, courage, justice, friendship, compassion, to even crippling shortcomings. It was a game that revealed much about the two contestants. Although real life duels have more to do with strategy and playing your cards right, the duels in Yu-Gi-Oh were all a part of an overarching story. Each character represented something unique to themselves, to their own ideals and characteristics. Yugi represented friendship, Atom represented justice, Kaiba represented pride, and so on. To add on to that, each character had cards that correspond with their traits as well. Yami and Yugi had cards representing valor, knowledge, the occult, from warriors, mages, divine gods, and so on. Many of Yami's cards were even followers of him in the past, like Dark Magician. Kaiba had powerhouse beasts showing off his proud and powerful nature, from legendary dragons to even a violent menacing god. Through these character traits, it felt that you could better understand them. You could better relate to the characters. Even if they possessed traits that you didn't coincide with, it helped you better recognize the characters' struggles, victories, and maybe even relate it to your life if you were dealing with something similar. If a series or certain characters captivate you enough to relate to your own experiences, from there it can inspire you for the better. If you relate to Yugi being a weak boy, seeing him gain strength and character, even through a magical alter ego would give you power. It will instill you with courage and inspiration. Same with seeing Kaiba overcome his pride and his past to eventually thrive with it. The fact that you are able to understand them and even relate to them brings you through a ride along with the character, inspiring you to grow alongside them if you were enamored enough by them. Of course, this is around in all sorts of fiction. It is what brings fiction to life through the effect it has on you. Takahashi undoubtedly wanted to do that with his series, especially through his main characters like Yugi. More on this later, but for now, I would like to introduce the ancient Egyptian depictions the series has. As most of you may know, much of Yu-Gi-Oh's concepts in the original series were tied to ancient Egypt. The ancient times of Egypt were said to hold incredible power and wisdom, most of which has been lost to the sands of time. Many of the world's secrets were left behind in the past and flash forward to the present time, we are left with the remains of the said great civilization. Yu-Gi-Oh seek to fill in some of those gaps in its own magical way, in a way true to the author Kazuki Takahashi. Although the story is a fictitious work by Takahashi, the series had a slew of references from ancient Egypt. Takahashi did a great job in infusing mythology, history, and the wisdom of ancient Egypt into Yu-Gi-Oh! and he doesn't get enough credit for it. Takahashi even went as far as to visit Egypt for research, and you can tell that Takahashi and his team knew what they were doing. Let's go through a few examples so we can better understand and appreciate his work. First up is Exodia, the Forbidden One, one of the most iconic cards in the game. Exodia is based off the god Osiris, who symbolized the underworld, death, and resurrection. In Egyptian mythology, Osiris had his body parts chopped off and scattered to different places. He was later put back together with some help. All of this is strikingly similar to Exodia, in how there are separate cards that you must summon to bring Exodia whole. Furthermore, 
Exodia cards can be summoned from the graveyard at times, further relating to death and resurrection, which is what Osiris governs. Speaking of incredibly powerful gods, the Egyptian god cards all have references as well. They are all related to certain Egyptian gods. These cards aren't exactly gods, but rather they are more so monsters of the gods, and so they do resemble them. The simplest one is the Winged Dragon of Ra, which references the king of deities, sun god Ra through name. Ra was depicted to have a falcon head, and so the Winged Dragon of Ra does resemble more of a falcon or phoenix head rather than one of a dragon. Ra was also known to have different forms that represent the different times of the day, and so you could say that the Ra cards represent his different forms. In the morning, Ra took the shape of a Kepri, a scarab beetle, and that is symbolic of the sphere mode card. During the day, Ra took on a human form and even had a falcon head, which again is similar to the regular winged dragon of Ra look. During the evening, Ra took on the form of an old man, this doesn't match with the three winged dragon of Ra cards we have, so maybe you can say that it is reminiscent of Ra's disciple, as it is most symbolic to a regular old man. Finally, during the night, Ra would travel to the underworld, to the realm of the dead, and be reborn, and that is reminiscent of the phoenix form, which is special summoned from the graveyard, as well as the phoenix's nature to rise from the ashes to be born again. Next up is Slifer the Sky Dragon, which was called the Sky Dragon of Osiris in the Japanese version, with it of course referencing Osiris through name. You could also say that Slifer's design is symbolic of serpent gods, Mehen and Apep, both of which are related to Ra. Mehen was considered to be Ra's protector when Ra voyaged through the underworld. It was also said that Mahen was the guardian of Osiris's corpse, protecting his body after death. This could help explain why the card was initially called Sky Dragon of Osiris in the Japanese version, before it was later changed into Slifer, the name of an executive of Yu-Gi-Oh, to distance the card from its Egyptian roots. On the other hand, the other serpent god, Apep, was considered to be Ra's enemy, seeking to swallow Ra in his voyage to the underworld, and even being dubbed as the Lord of Chaos. It was said that Ra engaged in many battles with Apep, as well as with other gods who aided Ra, including Set. Finally, we have Obelisk the Tormentor, which is called Giant Divine Soldier of Obelisk in Japanese. Obelisks are religious monuments of ancient Egypt. This one is a little harder to connect, but the card could refer to the god Set. Set was the god who chopped up the body of Osiris, so it makes sense that the god cards will be based on the two prominent gods. Furthermore, the card could be symbolic of Set, who is associated with violence and chaos. Funny enough, the character who had Obelisk the Tormentor was Seto Kaiba, whose first name has Set in it. Kaiba himself has violent and brutal cards that suit his personality as mentioned earlier. Furthermore, the high priest Seto betrayed the pharaoh and revolted against him, which could be related to Set betraying Osiris. And so perhaps Takahashi was aiming for a connection to Set with these characters. Yugi having Slifer, the card representing Osiris, would also further this connection. There were a bunch of other characters with references to God's names, with some being Sacred Phoenix of Nepotus, Sebek's Blessing, and Horus, the Black Flame Dragon. Speaking of Horus, the series also had the Eye of Horus, which showed up countless times in Yu-Gi-Oh. This is an Egyptian symbol of protection and well-being. Even Atom is a reference of the deity Atom, who was one of the first gods in Egyptian mythology. It was said that he created the world out of chaos with his own magic. The next symbolic reference would be the principles of Mahat. Mahat is an Egyptian goddess and Mahat is also a card that wields all seven of the millennium items. There are also seven concepts to Mahat. And so what I'm trying to get to is that the seven millennium items could very well represent the various concepts. Some items also have their own references to Egyptian mythology outside the principles of Mahat. The seven principles of Mahat are truth, balance, order, harmony, law, morality, and justice. As for the seven millennium items, they are the millennium puzzle, eye, ring, scale, key, rod, and necklace. The concepts aren't direct fits with all the items, so this is more of an incomplete theory, but we will go through it regardless and try to match the items with the concepts. 
First up we have Truth, which could correspond with the Millennium Eye, as that allows you to read minds and look into a person's soul, pretty much allowing you to see the truth. This could also be symbolic of the Eye of Horus. The Millennium Key also allows you to enter a person's mind slash soul, but this allows you to change it. For that reason, it could be a good fit for harmony, as it allows you to rearrange things to create harmony within a soul. This item takes the shape of an Ankh. The Ankh is considered to be the Egyptian symbol of life. Next, we will discuss order. This could be represented by the Millennium Rod as the rod seems like something a ruler would wield, and the pharaohs often held them. Furthermore, order is what a ruler strives to bring. The item allows for mind control as well as the ability to seal monsters, so it does fit well with order. As for justice, the scale will fit well with it. A weighing scale is often used to represent justice, from ancient times to present times. In ancient Egyptian mythology, it was said that when someone died, their heart was put on a scale and weighed against the feather of Mahat by Anubis, the god of death. This was also done in the Yu-Gi-Oh series. In mythology, if the heart was heavier, it meant the person committed crimes, and it would subsequently be eaten by Amit, the destroyer, a goddess with a crocodile head, body of a lion, and the bottom of a hippopotamus. The three animals Amit represented were considered to be the largest man-eating animals, and when a meat would eat a heart, it would doom the person's soul to the underworld forever. Funny enough, a meat shows up in Yu-Gi-Oh as well, during the use of the Millennium Scale, with the difference being that the guilty person is instead devoured whole. The Millennium Scale could also fit with law, balance, and even morality, so this can be moved around. The next three are a little harder to fit in with the remaining principles. With the Millennium Necklace, maybe law or morality would be a good fit, as it allows you to see into the past and future. This gives you the ability to judge who is right or wrong, and even learn from other times, helping you acquire morality. The Millennium Ring allows the user to find whatever they want, and so this is a tough one to place. The ring also contains the souls of dark beings, and it could turn on the user to harm them. Finally, we have the Millennium Puzzle, which unlocks the Dark Shadow games. The hieroglyphics engraved on the puzzle says, The one who solves me shall gain the powers and knowledge of darkness. The puzzle also grants your wishes and gives you better odds to win. The Millennium Puzzle is based on a pyramid, which is synonymous with Egypt. This could maybe fit with balance, as the puzzle contains both good and bad aspects to it, and you can say the same about the Millennium Ring. Which items fit the best with each principle? This theory may not be a perfect fit, but I'll leave it to you all to figure it out. Takahashi also introduced ancient Egyptian concepts of the soul to his series. We saw that with Ba, Ka, not to be confused with Baka. I don't want to hear another word! You're a disgrace to the game! As we see in the panel here, Takahashi infused these concepts into ancient duo monsters. The Ba and Ka were only a few components of the soul, with all of them being displayed here. While I won't go through every one of them, I do want you to keep Shadow in mind, as I'll be talking about that later. The last reference to history and mythology I will talk about in this section is an interesting one that could have perhaps inspired Yu-Gi-Oh! and its Shadow games. This was a story about Pharaoh Ramses II's son, Prince Setna. Setna, a prized scholar and magician, was in search for the Book of Thoth, an ancient set of scrolls set to hold incredible power. He, alongside his brother Anuru, would come to the tomb of Nefrekepta to uncover the scroll. In the tomb, Setna would come across a soul that warned him not to take the Book of Thoth, as Nefrekepta took it before him and as a result, his life was ruined with sorrow and misfortune. Setna would disregard the soul's warning, and state that he would take the book by force if needed. In response, the soul would agree to give the book if Setna would prevail in a game. They would play 52, an Egyptian board game. Setna would lose and every time he lost, he would sink deeper into the ground. Eventually, all of his body but his head was covered in sand. This was reminiscent of the Shadow Games from Yu-Gi-Oh, where contestants play games with dire consequences. Setna would eventually prevail in the game, as he would ask his brother for the amulet of Puta, and through it, he propelled himself up, stole the book, and ran off. In response, 
The spirit would say Setna would come back to him on his knees, begging for forgiveness to return the book. This would end up happening as Setna would have some terrifying dreams depicting the destruction of his family from his own hands. And through the guidance of his father, the pharaoh, he would return the book just as the spirit said. To make amends, Setna would bring over the bodies of the spirit's family to Nefrakepta's tomb and he would be forgiven by the spirit. The tomb was then buried so that none may ever find it. The shadow games in Yu-Gi-Oh often had one side that needed to be humbled and taught a lesson and in this case, that is what happened with Setna. I don't know if this story inspired Takahashi or what exactly inspired him to create the series but I felt it was a cool story that I should include in this video. All of this is honestly just an introduction to all the mythological and historical references in Yu-Gi-Oh. The rabbit hole goes deep and I'm sure there's plenty of more material out there related to this topic. The amazing part of this is that I am confident that Yu-Gi-Oh was riddled with even more references that have yet to be brought into light. The point I wanted to make was that Yu-Gi-Oh is incredibly underrated in this aspect and a lot of time and energy must have gone into it. I personally never knew any of this as a kid, which is understandable, but knowing it now adds a lot of depth to the series and I'm sure it must have inspired many to learn more about the ancient Egyptian civilizations and mythologies. With the Egyptian references now done, let's now discuss some notable themes of the series. There are a multitude of cool themes and ideas used throughout Yu-Gi-Oh! I won't have time to cover all of them so I'll go through some prevalent ones. There are many references to the shadows in Yu-Gi-Oh! Whether from the shadow realm, shadow games, or even the portrayal of the psychological shadow, all of which I will be covering. Shadows are often used to conceal the truth, whether it be mysterious past or the unknown. It is used to bring upon elements of mystery, suspense, and in Yu-Gi-Oh, the shadows infiltrate many aspects of the series. The shadow realm was coined through the dub version of the anime to ironically make things less darker. Instead of death, characters were sent to the shadow realm, a supposed milder substitute for death. In the shadow realms, characters will suffer for all their time there, but their souls can be saved and brought back to the normal world. What started as a euphemism for death could be considered far worse than death itself, as one can argue that death is a more favorable end compared to the unlimited suffering experienced in the Shadow Realm. Next up, we have the Shadow Games, the dark mystical games the series was founded upon. Shadow Games were chaotic trials that punished the loser in cruel ways, oftentimes bordering life and death. These games were used to bring upon justice, serving as its ultimate proving ground. The name of the Shadow Games were quite ironic since these games often reveal the true nature of the contestants rather than hiding them, which is what shadows usually do. In a way, these games cleared the shadows of doubt. They cleared the illusion of what people will portray to be, showing us who they truly were through the highest stake of games. Both the Shadow Realm and Shadow Games had dark aspects to them, hence the term Shadow. The use of the shadows was to signify the darkness, the side that often could not be talked about as it held the less favorable, more harsh aspect of life. In other words, things were about to get dark, shit was about to go down, and someone was probably going to die slash get sent somewhere for torture when the shadows were brought in. In order to enact the punishments of the shadow games, as well as to thrive in the high stake duels, Yugi had to resort to his shadow, Yami, to play the games. This leads to the psychological shadow, the last derivative of the dark that I will discuss. The shadow was mentioned in the Egyptian concept of the soul as hinted at earlier. Although I am no expert in Egyptian mysticism and ancient knowledge, I am more versed in the psychological shadow. So I'll be talking about this concept through the lens of modern psychology. The concept of the shadow must have been around for some time with different renditions of it all around the world. But in modern times, it was brought into light by Carl Jung, a huge proponent of the concept. In essence, the shadow is the part of our personality that we choose to reject and repress. In other words, the shadow holds certain parts of your personality that you have pushed away from you. Aspects that you refuse to associate with yourself despite it being there. In a sense, the shadow is a part of you that is always there, but you've hidden it away for whatever reason. Hence the name Shadow. It is the dark hidden side of your personality, holding everything you did not choose to associate yourself with. Despite that, the shadow is not inherently a bad thing. It is quite the opposite when viewed in the right light. Okay, but why am I bringing this up in a video of Yu-Gi-Oh? 
That is because Yami Yugi is the very manifestation of the shadow and it is further represented through the name he sometimes takes, which is Dark Yugi. The shadow usually houses the opposite of what you are. An aggressive and cruel person would have a shadow that is kind and peaceful, and vice versa. We see a picture-perfect version of this through Yugi and Yami. The shadow holds what you lack. It holds the repressed strengths, traits, and once it is brought to light, radical change and progress in regards to one's character can be made. That is the process of integrating the shadow. For Yugi, his shadow held great power. Most people like him. Weak, passive boys who are bullied are the same. Their strong, assertive, and even aggressive side is repressed deep down for reasons such as social conditioning, trauma, and so on. Yami, in a way, represented exactly that. In Yugi's case, someone like him would have never had it in him to punish evildoers. And that is where Yami steps in, his alter ego, which in a way is his shadow self taking over. Yami was the manifestation of all that Yugi could not bring himself to be, through his limitations, personality, morality, and so on. You may think that someone as weak and soft as Yugi, or maybe yourself, may not have any malice to them, any destructive tendencies, but that is wrong. Although Yugi may not show that side to others, it is often shown to himself. As someone with more weaker characteristics, he will beat himself up for things that went wrong, wallowing in self-pity and abuse. And whether you like that or not, that is a dark, harsh side to him. It is something we all do, and the fact that we do that shows us that we all have a darker side to us, to be able to torture a soul so much as we do to our own. Yugi would never verbally disparage someone, but I am sure he would do it to himself. That is just one example of the shadow, and it shows the deep repressed side of him, one that he refuses to show anyone else but himself. Integrating the shadow, making that repressed side of yours an ally, is what can be done to become whole. For Yugi, this was done through Yami, with Yami being his alter ego of sorts. Yami gave him strength when he needed it the most, and that is akin to drawing powers from the shadow self. It brought him balance, whether from being able to assert himself, win duels, or exact justice. While the shadow can hold traits that are considered positive, the opposite can be true as well. If your shadow holds negative traits, then bringing them to light will help you understand more on how to dispel them and live with your supposed demons. I'll give more examples of this concept in future videos on another series I have planned. To add on to the shadow, the concept is accentuated through Yugi and Yami's voice. Most anime main characters have higher pitched sounds that are usually voiced by female voice actors to portray the voice of younger audiences. That is similar with Yugi, but it's not the case with Yami. Yami Yugi has a more stern and deep voice, one more in touch with his masculinity, perhaps signifying the opposite of Yugi. Or it could have been done to accentuate the ancient old age of Yami's character. Another important concept of the shadow is the integration with it, which I have mentioned a few times earlier. This is an important process where you become one with the shadow. To harness its powers, you must confront your shadow many times, or rather duel it in Yu-Gi-Oh's case. This is synonymous with shadow work, which is the process of uncovering the repressed and hidden parts of your personality. We saw this in episode 163, when Yugi faced Yami in a duel for control. In episode 224, Yugi and Yami had a final duel meant to symbolize their merger as one. In a sense, Yugi had finally integrated with his shadow self, and that was symbolized through Yami parting ways with this world. It can be seen further through this quote. The gift of kindness you've given me, and the courage I've given you, will remain with us, and that will forever bind us together. This quote helps us describe the relationship between Yugi and his shadow, or his alter ego better. Yugi represented kindness, empathy, and similar characteristics, whereas Yami represented courage, valor, as well as its corresponding qualities. Both sides were incomplete without each other, but when both are bound together, working in harmony, that is when magic happens and they make a complete being. That is the merger with the shadow self. I think this is a beautiful quote that describes Yugi and Yami well. Two opposite sides of the same coin that helped each other where they were lacking. Only by being together and by learning from each other did they synergize to become the king of games. That in itself is what can be gained from your own shadow. The aforementioned quote describes the effect others have on us as well. How they are tied to us through what they have given us and taught us. 
Even if they are gone, they will forever be alive through you, linked through the memory and impact they had on you if you choose to integrate the effects to your very being. In a sense, you never truly walk alone, as the ones who have impacted you are forever there with you. In addition, I think this quote effectively describes the impact fiction as a whole has on us. Most of us may not have a distinguishable connection with our shadow or our inner strength, and many of us are not lucky to have role models to teach us such things, but fiction itself teaches us things that even the greatest of teachers cannot, and it has for a millennia. It is through the impact that it had on us that fiction becomes real, and through that impact it will forever be tied to us. I am not sure if Takahashi was inspired by Jung's work or by ancient wisdom. It could be that he knew all of this intuitively, or perhaps he got it from the Egyptian components of the soul, or maybe it was something he drew from other cultures. Regardless of where he got it from, he has included many concepts of the shadow masterfully. Takahashi depicts that good and evil, opposites, exist in everyone. The heart of the characters were a back and forth conflict between the two opposing sides and Takahashi used duels to represent that. He mentions how a pendulum swings all the way around to draw a circle. The strength of this hero does not come purely from the good, light, idealistic side, as many often portray, but it comes from both the light and the dark, both sides of the pendulum. It is a more realistic representation of a grounded, whole being. The light and the dark, both sides are needed to attain true strength, to become whole. And that is what he meant with the pendulum, swinging from side to side to eventually draw a circle. A quote by Carl Jung describes this well. No tree, it is said, can grow to heaven unless its roots reach down to hell. That is what we saw with Yugi and Yami Yugi. The bright boy harnessed the power of the darkness. He learned to control it, and both in turn became the king of games. The two sides would sway the pendulum back and forth, and in turn, create a circle, a complete being. This old Chinese proverb also describes this well. It is better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Further accentuating that duality we must all seek to become whole. The shadow or alter ego in Yugi's case shows us that no matter how weak you are, there is always a hidden inner strength deep inside you that you can harness, which leads to the next theme. In Yu-Gi-Oh, a common theme Takahashi wanted to portray was the hidden inner strength we all have. We all have this inner being, this inner strength that we can call upon when we need it the most. There is a strength inside us all. No matter how weak or small you are, you too can become someone better. You too can rise to become a hero just like Yugi. This theme was shown well through Yugi's shadow, but it is also prevalent throughout all the other Yu-Gi-Oh! spin-off series. It was a common theme that Takahashi wanted to replicate throughout Yu-Gi-Oh! And being a shonen series, this is often the case since it is directed at a younger audience. For Takahashi, this transformation, this growth was done through games, through duels. In our own lives, it is no different. We can harness this inner strength, our greatest potential, through our own duels. It is not something that we can gain through a flip of a switch, but it is something we must cultivate through our trials, something we must gradually draw out, as with each duel we get stronger, wiser, and better. Games in themselves are also a catalyst for growth, and that was the case for Yu-Gi-Oh! I am sure that is what Takahashi wanted to convey as well, being a lifelong fan of games. A certain man also had the same thoughts regarding games, as said below. Games are not boring. Games purify our souls and leave room for new development that challenges the mind. They are products of human wisdom. The man who said that was none other than Seto Kaiba. Kaiba does bring up good points, as when used right, games do exactly as Kaiba mentioned. Games are far from boring. And the fact that they have been around for more than a millennium is proof of that. In a world filled with more stimuli ever than before, games are perhaps the most popular pastime in this current world. Games really can purify the soul when used right, when the world all around you is in turmoil, when all is burning up in a ball of flame in your life. Games can be the window for you to catch your breath, it can be the break you need to recuperate. Many lessons about the self and life in general can be learned from games. Lessons that you never would have learned in real life. And that is further reason why it purifies the soul. And the same can be said for fiction. They both serve as inspiration for some, healing for others, and a source of joy for many around the world. Games undoubtedly challenge the mind, 
It is perhaps the most enjoyable and most available form of problem solving that forces you to adapt and change to succeed. A millennia of work has gone into crafting games, creating something to keep our minds occupied and entertained, and so Kaiba's words have truth to them when games are used healthily in moderation, like all things. It is pretty funny how I and many others grew up in a time when games were considered to be a distraction. It was thought that nothing good can come from it, but nowadays, people make a living off playing them, more so than ever in our history as a species. Games were around at the time of ancient Egypt as well, and so maybe that was one of the reasons why Takahashi chose to have Yu-Gi-Oh centered around it, as it could have been one of the earliest documented civilizations that played games. I am sure Takahashi would be proud to see how far games have come being a lifelong fan, and he is to thank for the growth and evolution of card games in our current time. Although games and inner strength are incredibly valuable to the series, I believe the next theme may be even more important. It is the theme that stood the test of time for all the Yu-Gi-Oh! series, perhaps its greatest and most prevalent theme, with that being friendship. Now before you sigh out of disappointment, I know this is at times overused, but it is a building block for the series. The names of Yugi and Junoichi are both derived from the word friendship in Japanese. Both characters are big proponents of friendship and do well to represent it. Friendship is a central theme in all the Yu-Gi-Oh! series and in essence, that is what the game is about. Yu-Gi-Oh! requires human connection as you cannot duel on your own. In the Anamanga, Duels may be a matter of life and death with a lot of darker aspects to it, but for us in real life that is far from the case. You will need friends in order to duel, and through dueling friendships are made. This is one of the themes that directly translates over into the real life game. In the first chapter, Yugi made a wish to his Millennium Puzzle to gain friends and that is exactly what happened. In a way, through Yu-Gi-Oh, that is what we all gained as well. We may never come to know each other or ever come to meet each other, but we all share similar experiences and memories when it comes to the series, and that is enough to start friendships. It was for me, especially when I was a kid, and I'm sure it was the same for many of you. All of this leads to the personal experiences and impact the series had on us. It's crazy how such a niche card game could bring together so many people, how a card game could make so many cherished childhood moments, how cards could unite so many people, start so many conversations, help you make new friends, and give you lasting memories. That was the impact it had on me, and I am forever grateful for it. What I found amazing was how many wishes Takahashi got ever since his death. There was an outcry of heartfelt mementos, as if we all lived the same childhood or had the same experiences. Who would have thought that a mangaka, someone who wrote stories, would touch these many hearts? I am sure he never would have imagined that he would get this much of an outpour, and I think he would be deeply touched to see everyone care this much about him and his work. After reading a bunch of comments online, it seemed that the biggest impact Yu-Gi-Oh! had on others is that it helped them meet new people, create new friendships, learn important lessons, keep them entertained through the various mediums of Yu-Gi-Oh! and finally, develop fond memories from childhood to adulthood. I wouldn't say I am the biggest fan of the series, but for whatever reason, Takahashi's death hit me harder than I would have thought. It opened the floodgates to old memories I had from the series. Memories that we all shared. It reminded me of all the fun times we had watching and playing Yu-Gi-Oh! All the friends we made through it, all the conversations it started, how it played a big part in so many childhoods, how it inspired us to grow and be better, how it became the most iconic card game, something that every fan had a part in. I began to recall when I was gifted my first card, to even when my father brought me my first pack, the feeling of awe and amazement to watch the series, and even duel in real life. Most important of all, it reminded me how everyone was so similar. We all had these core memories. This was something we all could relate to. And I found that to be beautiful. Something like a card game brought us all together and gave us meaningful connections and moments in our lives. I don't think the newer generation of people who don't know of Yu-Gi-Oh! understand what it was like at that time to watch an anime and then play the exact same game they are playing with the same cards in real life. It was very magical to be able to collect your favorite cards, craft your own deck, and eventually take on someone who did the same, who went through the same emotions and experiences. The various ways to enjoy Yu-Gi-Oh! helped cement the series in many lives, and this was something very few series were able to do. Looking back, what I enjoyed the most about the series has changed over time. 
At the time I first found the series, I had a different perspective. When I was younger, what I enjoyed the most was perhaps winning for once, or more so, it was probably collecting the same cards as my favorite characters, and getting to play them just as they did. That or just seeing all the cool monsters and their effect, as well as all the cool characters. But looking back now, it was all the great memories made through it. When I was younger, almost all the kids my age knew what Yu-Gi-Oh was, and so this was something we all bonded together on. The series brought us all together, it strengthened friendships, as many mutual hobbies do, and I feel it was that social connection that is what made Yu-Gi-Oh so great and successful. The words of Takahashi echo deeply when discussing this topic. He'd go on to say that if you made a friend through the shared interest in Yu-Gi-Oh, then he is a happy man. That is what brought him the most joy through his manga, to bring others together especially through his love of games and such characters that were so dear to him. Characters that were all a part of him in one way or another. All in all, it was very heartwarming to hear everyone's experiences with Yu-Gi-Oh! What got them into it, what impact it had on them, what it taught them, and the experiences it gave them. Somehow, I connected with everyone who shared their thoughts, despite all of us being vastly different. I would like to do something similar with this video. Share your thoughts with the franchise in the comments. I would love to hear your thoughts and experiences, and I'm sure everyone else would as well. Let's talk about a few other concepts in the series that we can relate to in our lives before we end things off. Concepts that resonate with the king of games, helping you reach that level. Starting with the heart of the cards. What is the heart of the cards? The heart of the cards would be the mystical ability to draw the exact cards when needed the most. Drawing the card you need when the stakes are at their highest. You can look at this in two ways. One, in having absolute confidence in your strategy or deck, knowing that whatever you draw will bring you victory. Or the more mystical aspect of focusing all your energy on drawing the exact card you need, coming across the one outcome you want, which is what I believe the heart of the cards truly is. In essence, the heart of the cards is the unwavering faith that things will turn out how you wanted them to. It is the incredible luck that makes its way to you when you need it the most. In other words, it is the strength of faith to the highest degree. It is assuming that what you desire has been manifested, and it in turn shows up in your life. But why am I bringing this up? Well, the heart of the cards can be used in your life too. The heart of the cards is synonymous with the sheer trust and belief in how things will go your way. One obvious benefit of this unconditional faith is that even when all is going to hell, even when you are at rock bottom, with the heart of the cards, it will lessen the burden and make things more bearable. Having faith in yourself or something else will always be better than not having any as it will set the stage for a strong foundation for your very being. You may say that doesn't sound very mystical, and you're right because that is just a small part of it. There is more to this than just unwavering faith to motivate and encourage you. There is a magical part of it that draws unfavorable outcomes to you when you need them the most. I am sure there is ancient knowledge regarding all of this, and so I will try to include that along with some modern examples. In ancient Egypt, as well as many other cultures, there was a belief that everything has a soul, even objects such as cards, and through a deep connection, that object becomes an extension of yourself. The object's soul and your soul begin to correspond with each other. Because that object is an extension of yourself, an attachment of you, it gives you the ability to manipulate the probability of what will happen with it. Your soul is connected through an unbreakable bond with the object. Your hearts are tied, and because of that, it is a part of you. Another way you can think of it is that everything has certain vibrations, certain energies, and having a deep connection allows you and the object to vibrate at the same frequency, to carry the same energy as you. An example from Yu-Gi-Oh! was with Yugi facing Kaiba early in the manga. Kaiba stole Yugi's grandpa's card, the Blue Eyes White Dragon, but he wasn't able to control it because the card carried someone else's heart, soul, vibration. Furthermore, this is not exclusive to objects, as it is similar to experiences, people, and so on. 
there are many ways of seeing this and I'm sure each culture around the world has its interpretations. Some modern terms of the heart of the cards and what I'm trying to refer to is the law of attraction or manifesting as people may call it. To simplify the aforementioned concepts, we learn that the mind is like a magnet and you attract whatever it is that you think of. The mind is like a radio and whatever frequency you choose to operate on, that is what your mind will magically pull towards you. If you constantly think about the good, it will eventually happen. And if you constantly think about the bad things, they will find their way to you. That said, just thinking about what you want alone will not bring these outcomes to you. Some works I would personally recommend on these subjects are those by Joe Dispenza and Neville Goddard, with Dispenza emphasizing a lot of science in his materials, and Goddard using many old sources like the Bible. Through the aforementioned authors, they mention that honing into your thoughts alone will not get you the outcome you desire. The key is to bring in elevated emotions, to replicate the feeling as if they have already happened. And that is where the faith that I mentioned earlier comes in. If you have the right thoughts and you can hone in on them, control them to focus on what you want and block out the intrusive ones. If you can attach positive feelings towards them, ones of purity, gratitude and joy, if your faith is so powerful that you can imagine it to have already happened, if you can imagine the emotions and visualize the experiences that arise from them, then whatever you want can be yours. That is what the heart of the cards represents, and it can be used in your life undoubtedly. Yu-Gi-Oh definitely portrayed the use of this, and we see it further in the quote below. If you worship something enough, random chance suddenly becomes the will of all powerful supernatural forces. I feel this quote is referring to what I mentioned earlier, how if you can hone into those thoughts, feelings, and experiences that you want to attract, it will magically find its way to you. Praying is an excellent time-tested form of what I have been trying to allude to, as it is perhaps the most ancient and successful form of it. In prayers, you ask God, the universe, and so on for blessings, and the blessings find their way to you. Through praying, it is important to state what you want, assign elevated emotions to it, and believe that you have received what you have asked for. Throughout this all, you must have faith and you must visualize the desired outcome as if it has already happened. That is how you activate this ancient power, and our kind has been doing it for longer than we can even fathom. Ancient texts also attest to what I have mentioned above. For example, the Kabbalion, which is a little harder to comprehend, but it does talk about the ancient hermetic teachings of ancient Egypt. I would like to think that these teachings would have been around during the time of Atom if Yu-Gi-Oh was real. And so if you're interested in ancient teachings of wisdom, I would check it out as it is a good place to start. You may think all of this is nonsense, but there is a reason these teachings have stood the test of time, from ancient times to now. But don't just take my word for it. If you're interested, do some research to better understand it, as this was just meant to be a mere introduction. Another thing I took away from Yu-Gi-Oh! was from the title of the series, The Path to Becoming the King of Games. In essence, the King of Games is someone who can play their cards to the highest degree, no matter the situation and come out on top, the best dueler. In a way, this can be a metaphor for our own lives. Life in itself is a game, and we are all dealt different cards, with the cards being things exclusive to you and your life, your traits, mental, physical, personality, experiences, possessions, connections, and so on. We don't get to choose many of our cards, but regardless of that, it doesn't mean we can't learn to play them in the best way possible. Just like the beloved characters in the series taught us. Just like how Takahashi taught us. Each card has its special effects and attributes. Each card can synergize with others. Each card can be played to make the utmost use of its value. And this is something we should think of for the multitude of things in our lives. As long as you have faith in the cards, the heart of the cards, things will turn out for the better. You may not have the best cards, the most expensive cards, or the longest list in your collection. But even so, you can learn to love all your cards, all the unique attributes of your life. You can learn to have gratitude and cherish all that you have. And through that itself, you will become a better player. A player who enjoys the game of life. 
a player who will eventually become more skilled with the hearts of all that you cherish by your side, as well as the gratitude of all that you have. Even if you don't have the best cards, it doesn't mean you cannot cherish them with all your heart, just like all the characters in the series taught us with their cards. Let's go back to the quote mentioned earlier by Yugi's grandpa to get a better idea of what I'm talking about. If you really treasure something, it grows a heart of its own, just like this card. You would never trade anything for that card. So take care of each and every card in this trunk, Kaiba. Then you'll find the true strength of the games. Cherish the multitude of things in your life, as if they were your prized possessions, as if they had their own hearts, because at the end of the day, they truly are unique to you, and are undoubtedly connected to you. They are an extension of your soul, they are the part of your deck called life. Instead of constantly chasing the cards you don't have, or hating your current ones, give some appreciation and gratitude for what you currently have, and make the most out of it. There may come a time when you may even upgrade your deck and earn some new cards on your path to becoming the best. Every beginner has a starter deck of cards, and so as you gain more experience, you also gain more cards. All of this in a metaphorical sense, that is. Again, the cards could be the people in your life, your memories, experiences, traits, what sets you different from others, and so on. No matter who you are and what you have been through, we can all learn a thing or two on how to best play our cards. And I think everyone who was once a fan should attest to this. We should all think of our life as a series of games, a series of duels, and use that passion and joy we have to play the best game we can in all aspects of it. Play with all your heart, with the utmost skill, and most of all, learn to have fun doing it. Create some fun memories, make the world better, and make some new friends in the process of becoming the best that you can be. The king slash queen of your own game. The one who plays your cards the best. If there's something we can learn and take from the series, I think all of that would be fitting. And it would be something Takahashi would be proud of. If you're still watching, I thank you for sticking around as we pay tribute to Kazuki Takahashi. To wrap things up, it's very wholesome how a simple card game touched so many lives. Whether it be through the anime slash manga or the cards themselves, Takahashi and his characters were a part of countless childhoods and countless lives. Although Takahashi is no longer with us, his heart lives on through the cards, and the cards live on through our hearts. May you rise to become the king slash queen of games in your own life. I'm rooting for you, my friend, and I'm sure Takahashi is as well on the other side. Hey, Pharaoh! I hate to break the terrible news to you, but you're not going anywhere, because everything you've given us stays right here in our hearts. Right. Like we always say, it's your move! No matter the hand you are dealt at the start, play your cards with all your heart. Play your cards with all your might. Utilize them well if you're smart. Let victory be your guiding light. Care for your cards like a body part. Play the best you can to make things right. For to play your cards well itself is an art. Your cards are everything that you are a part. So cherish your deck until you depart. You may think fate has been cruel, but know that your trials are the true jewels. They are a necessary part of your renewal. They are cultivated through your daily duels. You may think life has been hard, but its lessons are the valuable shards. With faith and hope held in high regard, keep true to the heart of the cards. If greatness is your aim, let faith and hope be your soul's flame. Let justice and honor be what you proclaim. Integrate the darkness, unshackle your soul's chain. Win your daily duels, rise up in fame. Do this and the world is yours to claim. With all your heart, make everyone know your name. Become the king slash queen of your own game.